Hello and good morning, good afternoon, good night, everyone, wherever you are at the moment, to the sixth edition of the ORFKC Annual Space Policy Dialogue 2021. And this panel is especially focusing on emerging space actors. Um, my name is Marcus uh, Moslechner, an unpronounceable last name. I'm based in the middle of Europe, um, Austria, that is right next to Uenosa. And I'm a filmmaker. I'm a host um, of Space Cafe podcast, which is um, hosted by um, or which is based uh, within the Space Watch Global family. And I'm super happy to be given this opportunity um, today to talk with you about such a such a incredibly uh, important topic as we are making history. I mean, like. Seriously, humanity is making history every single day, especially when it comes to the new space world. And more and more actors are discovering space these days. And it's such an incredible diversity. Um, just to give you a quick number, um, between 2000 and 2018, um, 600 private space companies were set up. Let me repeat that again, 600 private space companies. And um, as you can imagine, this produces huge chances, but also huge risks. And the interesting thing is that today uh, we're dealing with almost entirely new uh, state space actors, uh, among which are Australia, Indonesia, Nigeria, Poland, Thailand, Austria, also maybe one of the smallest places um, on this globe, also has its own uh, space interests. And so this is all uh, about um, democratizing um, space travel, the space industry, and um, ultimately to bring additional quality to our lives. This is also something that is super critical to consider um, space is not only producing increased quality in our lives, it has become a part of our lives. So I think it's not possible anymore to talk about the Earth, about humanity, about society, without at the same time talking about space. Because space is not just an endeavor, um, an experiment, a venture anymore. It is part of of the world we live in at the moment. And without space, our world we live in at the moment wouldn't be the one we're experiencing. So, but again, as I mentioned already, um, this produces a bunch of new questions, um, especially when it comes to traffic management, uh, especially when it comes to the growing problem with uh, congested space, um, because as vast as space is, around the Earth, in lower Earth orbit, we're get, getting ourselves into ever more problems. Um, and of course, I'm talking about the problem of space debris. So, um, what are standards? What are regulations? What kind of futures do we want to um, maneuver ourselves into? And there's an interesting um, analogy I would like to bring in, and that is the advent of Auto, automobile traffic. Um, in the very first days of automobile traffic, there was no structurized um, policies or traffic management, so to say. And of course, that led into issues. The more cars there were on the roads, the more problems came up. And at some point, um, traffic lights uh, got proposed. The first ones sort of produced their own problems because I think if I remember correctly, the first traffic light exploded and killed the police officer next to him. Um, and it took almost a hundred years um, to get or to come to terms with traffic management. I think in space we can do better. And um, so this is why I'm, uh, I would like to welcome uh, this terrific uh, panel of experts we have here today from different uh, geographic regions, bringing in their own unique expertise as they navigate their growth potential. So let me introduce the panelists. Francis Shisia. So please, everybody, I do have 
an unpronounceable last name. Please excuse if I'm butchering your last names. But again, Francis Chisia, Director General of the Nigerian Space Agency. Welcome. Thank you then very much, we have. Then we have Margaret Polkowska, Professor uh, Margaret Polkowska from the University of War Studies. Hello, Maureen. Then I would like to welcome Yunita Permatasari, researcher in the Center for Aerospace Policy Studies, National Institute of Aeronautics and Space. Hello, everyone. Then Vong Santivanic Vazanchai. I hope I pronounced that almost in a similar or in a meaningful direction. Head uh, Strategic and Operations Aerospace Research Center. Yeah, okay. Welcome. You pronounced, it, you pronounced it correctly, so good afternoon, everyone <laughs> from Thailand. <laughs> Thank you. And um, Malcolm Davis, a senior analyst from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Uh, good evening, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time. Let's kick this off with um, a very obvious and um, clear question to all of you. Uh, what are the main drivers for emerging space programs? Uh, what are the key factors driving the space programs in the respective countries or locations you're in? Uh, Francis, I started introducing you, so you were the first one. So um, let me give you the opportunity to kick this off with an answer, if you if you will. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. So, well, one of the key drivers for the involvement of uh, or the imaginations in space today is basically for social economic development. This is a major requirement for most especially when you're looking at uh, countries from the third world who uh, have issues of low GDP, life expectancy, literacy levels, uh, level of employment available to its citizenry. Uh, most imaginations have realized that using space science and technology, many of these issues can be tackled and be properly tackled by the nation. And these are very essential to ensuring that uh, the people uh, uh, have a better life. Like you mentioned in the opening statement, in all aspects of our lives today, we need and we have to use space science and technology. Thank you, Marcos. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Margaret Polkowska, uh, would you um, join um, Francis in answering the first question, what the main drivers for emerging space programs are these, these days, from your experience? Uh, thank you very much, Marcus. Yes, I agree with my predecessor. Of course, economy is number one, but we also should think about political environment and regional and international cooperation. I mean, international organizations, which uh, uh, is quite important for uh, every every new country. Of course, Poland is not a space power. It's never been and probably never be. But we like to be in the center of what's going on in the world, we're going to cooperate, we're going to share experiences. So not only economy, but also researches and knowledge. We'd like to uh, share, we'd like to have new experiences. We are ambitious like a nation. We have new students, uh, I can tell you about them because I, I'm teaching, so they, they are very anxious and, and uh, very eager uh, to have uh, more experiences, more knowledge, more um, uh, uh, cooperation uh, in regional format, in international format. That's uh, one of the um, uh, reasons why we are so close to European Union, to European Space Agency, and we cooperate together and thanks to this cooperation we have programs we have a future for our students for our young generation who's gonna be someone in future uh, referring to space thank you wonderful yunita uh, pematasari um would you want to be the next uh, what are the key factors driving the space program in your respective part of the world or would you like, like to add something to the previous speakers? 
Okay, thank you. Uh, the key factors driving this best program of Indonesia are increase socioeconomic impact and get the safe, secure, stable conditions to answer the sustainability of the use, utilizations, and development of Indonesian space activities. As still an emerging space country, uh, should make sure uh, international agreements don't hinder it. And maybe I would like to uh, ed edit some uh, uh, information about the mind driver for emerging space program in Indonesia because uh, Indonesia with special geographical conditions uh, being on the equator and an archipelago and prone disaster, also huge population, it is a great interest in mastering the independence of space technology. Also, uh, coupled with Asia as the center of economic growth, it is uh, very uh, will further encourage the development of the space economy and achievement of the SDGs in the region, thus placing new pace of Indonesian space program. Indonesian master plan on space activities uh, includes space commercialization as one of the focus programs to be developed, as well as mastery of space technologies. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Yunita. Um, and our next speaker, uh, speaker Vong San Tivanich Van yeah. Please, <laughs> you can call you can call me Van Sanchai in back to okay. So thank you. Actually, actually, this is a very classic question, and I will give you a classic answers, which is like you know, I believe that most of the emerging space nations will put it in the proposal when they want to build up the, the space agency for the country. So mainly, it's about you know, like building national capacity and competency in terms of. Uh, economic and technology. This is very common. And, and I think it's common among all of the emerging space uh, nations. The second thing that is, uh, is, is, is uh, the, the drive is uh, the national needs in terms of, you know, like the technology of uh, agriculture, productivity, uh, smart farming, uh, disaster response, or even military. And this is like, it's a short term goal that you, why you need space that, that normally they put in. And the, the last thing that uh, normally people don't say, but it's, it's, it's there, is uh, about the national pride. Because normally, like people go to space, it's like one thing that you can use as a uh, political promotion. Or if, at, at the end, it's, it's about the, the pride of like you can go to space, something like that. So I think there's three three main things that that, that drive the, the the emerging space nations, and which is what I observe that happen in, in my country. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Malcolm Davis, please. Australia, I think, is, is an old space power in the sense that um, you know, we were active in the space programs uh, of the uh, European Launch and Development Organization back in the 1950s and the 1960s. And we let it go um, at the end of the 60s when uh, ELDO pulled out uh, of Australia testing from Woomera. And we haven't really done anything with it until very recently where the Australian government recognised the potential offered by commercial space, space 2.0 and new space, to have a, a booming economic sector. So I think our first driver uh, in establishing, re-establishing the Australian space sector is to grow our commercial and economic uh, potential through space, through uh, essentially establishing that commercial space sector. And that's where you see Australia's commercial space sector now uh, as very young, very vibrant, but rapidly growing, and it has strong government backing, uh, and I think it has a really positive future going forward. Second um, uh, factor that would be shaping our space interests is, of course, defence and national security. Uh, we recognise that it's vital for Australia to be, uh, uh, as an ally of the United States, it's vital for us to be active in space, not just in terms of you know, providing a suitable piece of real estate for American uh, facilities, uh, but also for, for bird sharing and orbit. So you are seeing now the growth of sovereign Australian space capabilities, including sovereign launch capabilities uh, that will enable us to burden share in orbit to a greater degree. And I think the third aspect that's driving us is uh, an interest in uh, multilateral space cooperation with key allies in the Five Eyes and beyond, uh, in not just in terms of defence and national security, but also in terms of civil uh, and commercial space activities and space science. And finally, it's STEM, it's inspiration, it's growing the next generation of leaders and thinkers in space. So for these four areas, uh, Australia is becoming a true space power. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to, 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 for my next question, I would like to, to shift our discussion a little bit into, into a way where we try to analyze or find the pain points uh, we need to 
we need to discuss because this panel should be um, used also um, as in its most productive way. So maybe we can use that as an ex exchange also how to deal with pain points and maybe we're all sharing similar pain points. Um, so let's talk about briefly the role of your country um, in the future for the private space sector in your space program. And maybe let's not only talk about what you're envisaging, but also let's also talk about the issues, the problems that go together with that. And most of the problems and issues, I guess, are not solved yet, but maybe we can learn from one another and maybe we can exchange ideas how others deal with it or we will find that this is a common problem we're facing and that needs to be discussed on a different level so who would like to 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 jump in look i'm happy to go first um sure i think that uh you know for australia um as i said we're starting new but we're moving very fast um, traditionally, we have been what you might call a ground-based space power in the sense that we've uh, provided ground facilities and we've relied on others to provide the space segment, the satellites, the launch vehicles. I think we're now moving beyond that and so we are starting to develop our own satellite uh, development and manufacturing uh, section in our economy, in our space economy. And also we're moving towards sovereign space launch capabilities as well, where the goal is for Australia to be able to launch Australian satellites on Australian launch vehicles from Australian launch sites on a regular basis. But there are some challenges going forward with that. The first is culture uh, is in terms of shifting mindsets and shifting thinking to uh, away from this dependency on others uh, to recognise that Australia can actually do it itself. And that's been a bit of a challenge, certainly in the early period of restoring our space capabilities. Second point I would say is uh, that um, we are facing bureaucratic regulatory challenges like every other state in terms of doing new things that have some risk involved. And certainly in the sovereign launch area, um, there is a, a debate at the moment about how to avoid government over-regulation over about launch insurance uh, smothering uh, our launch capability before it even gets off the ground. So there is this challenge in terms of the regulatory space, in terms of trying to get the balance between innovation and regulation correct. And I'll certainly hand over to the others in the panel to give their thoughts as well. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Can I speak a bit now, Marcos? Sure, absolutely, Francis, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I, I want to lay my voice to the last speaker. Uh, everything I said is correct, but the uh, situation appears to be uh, slightly different in some other part of the world based on the economy. Uh, for example, uh, a space agency or the government of Nigeria believes that the major driver or those that will likely drive our space program should be the private sector. But as of today, 100% of the investment we see in space comes solely from government. And the sooner we have active participation of the private sector in our space industry, then we'll be able to, we can sustain the temple we're carrying. It cannot be a government affair. It's too expensive for government to run. Most of the private sector we try to bring in, they are not very ready to to, to go through that too late period, you know, putting money and carry out research that will take years before you start investing. They are very happy to invest in telecommunications. It's quick money for them. They, they, they see a satellite, a transponder is available, the rent and lease transponders for live TV programs and they get their money in there. But for space programs to be sustained, a lot of investments needs to go into the program. That is one, for R&D. If you don't do R&D, you cannot remain in the system. And that is one major challenge you'll be facing back here in Nigeria, is how to bring in the private sector to invest 
But we also note that they're going to be the major drivers of this program. What mm -hmm. government will now sit back and do part of the regulations to ensure that they conform with international norms, national, uh, national norms, or even regional laws that guide our operations in space. But it's not for government to do everything. Government today is spending a lot of money on research into launch vehicles, research into building satellites. All the satellites have been built by Nigeria, have been built by the Nigerian government. Right now, we are uh, trying to build, make a uh, build in-house satellites. We have to, uh, there are people that can build that in the airports. But we need to bring this up to the public to put in money and bring in money to it. In the real sense, uh, government is not in there to make money. Government is in there to provide the services to the people. And we don't want to get into the business. So that would be a big problem. Coming into it, investing into it. Of course, you know, uh, space uh, business is very expensive. Uh, investment in space runs into billions of dollars. Very few of them are ready to put down this money and wait a while before they start replaying the profit of whatever they are in. I'll stop at this point, Marcos. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. This is this is highly interesting. Yunita, um, if I may ask you, um, do you have similar experiences uh, in Indonesia as, as Francis yeah. just mentioned? <laughs> Yes, I agree with the uh, uh, speaker before. And uh, maybe in Indonesia's perspective is the private sector uh, also, also as a catalyst in mastering space knowledge and increasing socioeconomic in impact. But uh, especially in Indonesia cases through the commercialization of space. But uh, Indonesia has not yet have a small and medium-sized company or an established large industry. And uh, in, however, Indonesia is promoting business in in the space sector with their governmental policies or mechanisms and there are non-governmental organizations that promote space business example association for satellite operators and also in indonesia private entities are engaged in the space environment utilization program which includes the experience experiments and technology demonstration, utilizing microgravity, radiation, and other unique features of the space environment. And through one of Indonesia's main space programs, namely commercialization itself, the prospect of industrial participation is a very wide open. And the pattern of relations between the state and a private business group is pursued through the coordination and cooperation in parallel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Malko Rosato or Wasan Chai, do you want to add something to this topic? Sure. Uh, thank sure. you, uh, thank uh, you, Marcus. I agree with my previous speakers, of course. Um, uh, maybe adding that we have a Polish space strategy, uh, which was adopted a few years ago, and we have um, big strategy goals until 2030. And one of them is uh, private sector. We like uh, the private sector to be competitive in Europe. Of course, as I said, we are not a space power, but we, are, we, we have ambitions. We'd like to share our knowledge. We'd like to um, uh, cooperate. And I think that uh, our Polish Space Agency created in uh, 2014 should be like a focal point to help um, startups, to help young um, ambitious people to um, create a company, to start working in a space and showing them it's, it's, it's a worth work the business uh, and on the other side making a strategy or any kind of national program any kind of of law which is also necessary for for the for the business they should take uh, into account the needs and possibility and big big challenges ahead for them so i think that uh, that's a big role of space agents in our country to to be um, to motivate to be a driver uh, also for for startups and private business which is also a priority for our strategy thank you mm -hmm. okay so, so it's me the last one <laughs> sure okay so I, I started differently so for, for thailand i think we are lucky because like uh kind of got introduced to space about like 30 or 40 years ago since uh, the, i think this is the end of cold war because at that time there were abundant supply of you know space data from the cold war and, and the introduction of soft power and using space as soft power and the thing is uh, you know bangkok is a hub of you know international organization so there were a lot of like talks and, and meetings in bangkok about space so at that time uh, thailand got very well introduced about 
no space applications and those kind of things. So it means that with a long uh, 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 experience about space application, so in terms of, of, of this thing, the, the, the downstream of space is quite mature in China. You can see a lot of you know private sector working in Thailand, serving government and, and, and yeah, like the end user about the, the remote sensing or the navigation, those kind of things. That, that is not quite important because you know it's common for every country. In terms of the, the midstream of space, like space operation and the communication, it's lucky again that you know uh, we, we have a big company, Tycom, uh, the, the communication company. They, they did a quite early start, it's about 30 years ago. Uh, they, they have now a satellite in geo, so they're they, uh, how to say, uh, providing service to the Asia Pacific region. So, in terms of operation, it's, it's quite mature in Thailand. But the thing is, the most important uh, things that we talk about here is the upstream. It's about you know building capacity for the the, the, the space assets, the satellite, those kind of things, which is quite new in Thailand. The, the first our first big space program was the turnkey product uh, we got from Europe, from France, and and it was not quite successful in terms of capacity building because you know like it's a turnkey, so nothing was transferred quite you know uh, 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 that we can kickstart ourselves in terms of developing. I think four or five years ago, the government were trying to, you know, like uh, jumpstart that by uh, trying to use the cross sector uh, technology transfer, like, you know, introducing space to other sectors like automotive or, or electronics, uh, a big industry to, to try about space. But that was not quite successful because, you know, the demand, the real demand was not there for the, for, for the things. And these few years, the government was trying as well to promote, like, you know, new space and, and startup. But there is challenge over, over there because, you know, uh, uh, the upstream path for space is quite difficult. You need experience and competency. And I think that I can conclude of what, my, of what I can see. And, and I think uh, we have to think carefully about, like, how to... It, it's not just promoting. It's, like, because you have to build the demand to, to kickstart those kind of things. So this has to be planned carefully and see it to, to make it, you know, uh, continue sustainably as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I would like to try to think into a direction now that maybe could could sound naive, but at the same time maybe pose an interesting future for all of us, um, because space, the new space industry, proposes an opportunity for all of us to go beyond the usual the usual um, ways to do things as we're doing them on the planet, leading into the obvious um, issues when it comes to polluting our planet and um, the obvious questions as to how we deal with resources. So my question would be, and what I'm sensing at the moment is still, that each and every nation, country, player want to do their own thing in space. And the question is, would this propose an interesting field of collaboration, a lot stronger collaboration, because the space industry is such a such an expensive industry. So, because you, uh, uh, Malcolm uh, Davis, you mentioned that Australia is doing its own thing, has been doing it for for quite a while, then lost touch, and and now is doing it again. The question is. Is it necessary that each country, nation, player have and needs to pro provide everything? So their own launchers, their own satellites, their own technology, their own whatever. Because I mean, like in Germany, neighboring country to Austria, is one of the hottest stocks in the European launcher segment with ESA Aerospace. So Germany isn't your poster child for current space travel. <laughs> he used to be, of course, as we know. But of course, now the question is, why Germany in space? There is no geographic benefit to a launch from Germany into orbit. So the question is, would it make sense to distribute um, experiences and talents over different players and try to collaborate more strongly? Or is it is it a naive question I'm, I'm trying to discuss here? Because, of course, we're seeing a globalized economic field that we're in, a structure that we've been living in for such a long time. Anyone? 
Well, you, you, you mentioned me, so I'll, I'll go first. Um, look, I, th I think Australia has uh, done the dependency approach and where we've relied on others to provide certain capabilities. Uh, and now we are going down the path of, whilst we're not trying to do everything, uh, we are doing a lot more, both in terms of satellite manufacturing, satellite design, uh, sovereign launch capabilities, ground segment. Uh, we've just recently announced, for example, we're sending a rover to the moon to support Project Artemis with NASA. So, you know, we are doing an awful lot. But, but there are advantages, I think, um, and times when it makes sense to collaborate and to find a, a niche uh, to invest in, in certain types of capability. Uh, and there are advantages uh, to have the freedom to choose when you want to do more than just the niche. Uh, and I think Australia is in that uh, comfortable position where we actually have the opportunity to choose when we want to just go down the path of, of one particular type of capability and when we want to do a lot more. We're never going to be completely autarkic. We're never going to do everything. Uh, but certainly we can do a lot more than we've done in the past, particularly in terms of utilising small satellite technologies, uh, CubeSats that, that can be used as fractionated constellations and uh, low-cost sovereign launch for those satellites and the ability to uh, support um, the return to the moon later in this decade and, and going mm -hmm. on to mark the ability to utilize space resources. So, um, you know, these are all important um, opportunities for us. And I think we'd be silly to uh, essentially ignore those opportunities in favor of just purely finding a niche and not straying out of it. But others may have different perspectives. They are, um, sort of, it's not a case of one size fits all here. Francis, you seem to you seem to have something on your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, uh, cooperation, uh, like I mentioned in my earlier statements, um, investment in space science and technology is very huge, and um, probably very difficult for most nations to be able to say they're going to invest alone in space. In as much as yes, I support need for nations to come together, to work together, either on a uh, regional, global, or even um, uh, uh, sectoral cooperation. There's still the need for each nation, like what Malcolm said, to build some capacity and capabilities to some certain extent in almost all areas of space science and technology because the need might arise or could arise and you can start from afresh. Um, for example, uh, you see Germany would not want to put too much into investments into a launch facility because of their geographical location. That's good. Um, other countries are better located for launch. Yes, they could put in more money, but doesn't mean that you stop research into building of satellites because uh, they can launch. They need to also have those capacity and capabilities at all times. And also being able to have these capabilities like uh, Malcolm said earlier, also allows you to carry out when you have specific needs. You know, if you're cooperating with a group or a particular country, you must conform within the agreement or what they want. As a country, as a sovereign nation, you might need a bit more than what is being uh, proposed via that cooperation. Then you're able to invest a bit more. And since you already have the capacity and the capability to do such, then you can do that. I will bring an example of the issue of the African space policy, uh, African space policy and strategy. Um, uh, luckily, I was one of those uh, that uh, members of the working group that developed the document. And part of what we did was to find out what are the capabilities and capacities that are available in Africa at present, to know how do we tilt it together. How do we come together as a continent to carry out mm -hmm. programs that are specific to Africa that mm -hmm. affect all of us as a continent, that will be of importance to the average African country, because then they all have to invest in it. Now, if you look at the African 
uh, continent as a whole. The the region are different from the top. You have the Mediterranean. You now have the desert. You have the sub-Saharan area. Then you start going down towards South Africa. The requirements are huge and different. And if you have to invest into a program, it must have direct impact on my society or else I would not invest in such a program. So the, the need to yes, come together in areas where we have close similarities is there. But building capacity and capabilities in space science in, in all sector, in all aspects of it, I totally support that. But the need for it to come together where you have common goals, common missions in certain areas, nations, countries, even the private sector should come together and develop it. Thank you very much, Marcos. Mm -hmm. That um, nicely leads into a more global question I would like to ask, and that is what role can international and regional space organizations play in, uh, play in enhancing space collaboration between established and emerging space actors? Mazan Chai, do you want to start? Okay, I can start. Uh, so, actually, uh, I would say Thailand is, uh, from the situation that is happening this day, Thailand is a Casablanca of space. <laughs> we have one ministry that deals with, you know, mm -hmm. with China, the other ministry talks with Japan and those kind of things, right? So, we can see that these day, uh, space is one of the, the tools, that, uh, the diplomatic tool that used as a soft power. And the, the thing is, like, you know, of course, uh, you, you say that, uh, the question is about like uh, what is linked between you know like uh, international organization uh, enhancing the collaboration. Of course, if you look back into uh, into the background of why there is uh, international organization, is it's because of the push of the how to say the the the, the, the space faring countries want to push the technology and manpower to the emerging space station. For example, in Asia Pacific region, we have two big uh, groups. One is uh, APSCO, led by China. So you can see like that 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 is one thing. And another another thing is like. APSR fleet by, by JAXA, by Japan. So, so the thing is like, uh, the, the, the emerging country, uh, emerging space countries uh, in, at the, 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 how to say, the end of, of this collaboration, right? So we have to, to choose carefully based on, you know, what is the need of the nation and to balance those, those, those collaborations to, 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 to make the country be able to strive in this, <laughs> in this mm -hmm. uh, new space world. So that, that is my, my mm -hmm. observation. Nice and wonderful. Marcos Sata, do you want to join? Yes, Marcos. I cannot imagine a space without collaboration, without cooperation. It's a common heritage of mankind, uh, according to the Outer Space Treaty. So international arrangements like um, uh, uh, agreements with different agencies or entities are, are crucial here. So states have strengths and weaknesses, of course. It depends on their will to, to be involved in, in agreements, uh, to be involved in international organizations, activities, but I think it's crucial that someone is supervising what people are doing in space. Without it, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be very um, uh, uncomfortable and risky uh, to start business in space. So I think uh, that uh, today there are so many organizations, even in Europe, like UMETSAT, European Defense Agency, European Space Agency, of course, and, and, and others, uh, and other entities who are en engaged in a particular part of space because it's so complicated today. There are um, domain like robotics, IT, like like uh, rockets launching, so so many different uh, sectors. So I I'm pretty sure that that uh, entities and international agreements with them and organizations are taking part of this. Of this, and we can choose. Uh, states can choose whatever they like, but uh, of course, according to the international law to make it peaceful and uh, in the name of the benefit for, for all of us. Because as I said, uh, space is a common heritage of mankind. It's for us and for our generations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Unita. 
Yes, thank you. I do agree with uh, previous speakers and also because it's important role of the international organizations uh, for facilitating the sharing information and discussion and best practice in technical and legal challenges uh, also for enhancing capacities in establishing and implementing national space activities and legislations and also for build collaborative platform for tackling common issues and also for to uh, contribute to the global agenda such as the sustainability of space activities and stable use of outer space and so on. And also uh, Indonesia see that through this international organization, emerging space actors can start to increase their role and accommodate their needs, not only uh, just arena for the space faring nation to uh, widespread their influence, but also it is an arena for emerging space actors to strive their role and accommodate their needs. Uh, Marcos, uh, can you allow me to sure. just uh, say a few words sure. here? Uh, it would be unfair of me not to talk here. Uh, 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 being the present uh, vice chairman for COPUS, which is a major platform, uh, platform for international cooperation in the areas of uh, the peaceful use of outer space. Um, international cooperation is a vital uh, requirement in how we use space. I'm glad my predecessors have said it. If everybody go into space the way they want to, it's going to be chaos. We'll just end up uh, messing up the whole spot. So the, the requirement to have international collaboration in to guide how each nation participates in the space arena is very vital. Uh, I'm aware, uh, and the men, most of you must be aware, uh, just a month ago, uh, we at the Bureau for Couples presented uh, a document we call Space Agenda 2030 and the implementation plans to the UN General Assembly for adoption. This is uh, uh, an outcome of uh, a document negotiated by all 95 member states of Couples in Vienna. And this is just bring out an agenda. How do we intend to carry out space? It doesn't, it proposes how nations should work, how nations should come together and carry out activities in space to ensure that everybody has equal access where you have the capability, of course. Uh, we have to come back, we'll, we'll call emerging nations. Most of the laws that guide what we do in space was not negotiated by any of the emerging nations that are speaking today. These laws were enacted and agreed to by the UN and is applicable to all of us today, whereas we never had any opportunity to make uh, an input in this document at the point or at the time when these documents were being approved as a working doc, as a global working document. Now the chance has come on the platforms like COPUS where we could sit down and start having a say I mean, it, it, it doesn't, I, I still recall some years back, I think about uh, 10 or 15 years ago, when we were trying to explain to Mr. President that we're going to launch our communication satellite and it cannot be launched over Nigeria, that the satellite will be placed on 45 degrees east because the satellite that is over Nigeria is owned by Intersat. Now I can build, I can purchase at the point and my own satellite that will be optimal for my own activities and probably provide services for the West African region and the sub-Saharan areas and probably part of the Central Africa. But I have to launch it, the spacecraft, towards South Africa because that's where the other slots were available for us to do so. And when these slots or orbits uh, were being distributed, most of we imagine nations had not realized the importance or the need for us to be in space in the first place. Mm -hmm. So having forums like COPOs, national organizations that will come in, go to voice and be given the chance to be able to come in completely into, into the uh, into the, uh, the field of play when it comes to space is a very crucial part mm -hmm. of it that no nation, in fact, all emerging nations are crying for it. Today we have at COPOS what we call the Group 77. That is a Group 77 of developing emerging nations. Group of 77 and China, and that's how it's called. 
and group of some seven and China. Because as much as you want to bring in China as a third world country, uh, China's capabilities in these areas are way, way as close as probably what you see in, in the US because they could launch, they can build their satellites, mm -hmm. they have space station, they can send probes to the moon, probes to, 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 to space. Francis, these are capabilities Francis. that are too far from us. Francis, I have to be very impolite because we're running out of time. Okay. <laughs> now, oh, now, now, that things are, now that things are getting super interesting, um, as usual, we're running out of time. So I would like to ask all of you now for a very brief, very brief closing remark. Um, just imagine you have the last say for your country or institution when it comes to um, the future of space, the future of space travel. What would um, last line for this last say be you have 20 seconds per person so what would you like to share now with the audience um, Markham uh, shall we start look I think uh, that our future in space is, is uh, potentially uh, amazing uh, the potential for making humanity a spacefaring species a multi-planet species I think is a fantastic vision uh, the ability for space to be uh, a new center of economic activity is part of that. I think that's where we need to be aiming for. If you want the big vision for the future, uh, humanity is a spacefaring multi-planet species. Wonderful, thank you so much. Margaret Zata, your 20 seconds. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, I would like to say that we should be happy to have uh, outer space and to to have possibility to cooperate in space, but please do it safely and peacefully because it's uh, all for us and for our uh, future uh, generation. Thank you. Thank you. Unita, please. Okay, thank you. Indonesia, and with the long history of the outer space and the era of democratization of space and the rising of emerging actors in space, the world faces issues that cannot be resolved unilaterally. Your need for cooperation among the major powers and all responsible countries to resolve these issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wasan Jai. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, to, to conclude, uh, space is sexy, space is expensive, so it's very, and resource is limited, so it's very important that we, we work to, together. Wonderful. Yeah. Francis, your final remarks. Well, as we said, uh, there is no way to pull out space in the future and the survival of, so we all have to invite space science and technology now more than ever. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Malcolm Davis, Margozata, Polovska, Yunita, Permatasari, Mazanchai, I'm skipping your last name, and Francis Gisia. Um, thank you so much for um, being part in this panel of, on emerging space actors at the sixth edition of the ORF KC Annual Space Policy Dialogue 2021. Thank you so, so much for taking the time and have a great rest of the current edition of this wonderful um, dialogue. Thank you so much.